Hello everybody, welcome back to the course on optical properties of nanomaterials. In this part of the lecture we want to discuss a few applications of metal nanoparticles. So just to recap, last week in, or in last week's lecture we discussed the optical properties of a noble metal nanoparticle and we saw that there can be or there is a so-called localized surface plasmon resonance and this arises from or is a consequence of the possibility of a metal to have a negative refractive index below the plasma frequency. This then gives rise to a maximum in the polarizability and this in turn creates a very strong absorption and scattering event and this is known as this um, LSPR resonance. And then we have discussed the consequences of changing size, shape, surrounding, um, distance to other particles and so on and so forth and have seen that um, in accompanying this localized surface plasmon resonance is a very strong focusing of the electromagnetic energy of the light wave into a very small area surrounding the particle. And this is known as a hotspot region. And what we will do today is try to see um, how we can exploit these different properties of uh, noble metal nanoparticles in applications. So what we want to discuss is, first of all, how we can use metal nanoparticles for detection and sensing. And then secondly, how we, think we can use metal nanoparticles as localized heat sources. And thirdly, I want to discuss a commercial example of um, gold nanoparticles and of this change in, in color and so on um, with um, the discussion of a pregnancy test. Okay, first, let's jump directly in and discuss how metal nanoparticles can be used for sensing. And for this, let me briefly show to you on the blackboard again why this is generally possible. So the key concept is So we have seen that the frequency of this resonance we can excite in noble metal nanoparticles depends on the plasma frequency and 1 plus 2 epsilon medium. So this means if we change the medium, we change the frequency or the wavelength of the plasmon resonance. So the idea is if we have a nanostructure here on the surface and this nanostructure this nanostructure has a certain resonance wavelength lambda LSPR and now I code this structure. So I change the environment of the particle. I can detect this change by a shift in the resonance wavelength. So this is the property of a sensor that you do something and you can detect it by a certain readout. In this case, the readout is optical. Good. So now let's see what we can do or how we can um, apply this. So this is what you see. If we change the refractive index of the environment, we change the resonance wavelength so we can optically detect it. And this is what I just showed you on the blackboard. Okay, first thing is how do we make gold nanostructures? Of course, you can simply put gold nanoparticles either in solution or put it on a substrate. I will briefly introduce you a different way on how we in, in, in our lab do this. We assemble particles, typically silica or polystyrene particles, and then we simply evaporate gold through this assembly of particles. That means the gold also goes into these interstitial sites. And if we then remove the particles, we are left with an array of these gold nanotriangles. So this is what you see here, an assembly of polystyrene uh, nanoparticles or colloidal particles. You see here these interstitial sites already that we can use as a mask to structure our gold film. And you see we can do this over fairly large areas, easily in the centimeter square a size range. Now if we deposit gold and remove the particles, this is what we have left. 
very clearly this is gold, very uniform and monodispersed triangles that are made of gold. And we've already seen the triangles or the structures with sharp tips that we have here as well have a fairly high near field enhancement and this as you will see is very efficient to make a good sensor. Okay, so now what can we do with it? First example, let's see if we can detect a change in a film thickness that we deposit on top of these um, plasmonic sensors. So uh, the strategy is we make our structures, then we deposit thin films with a controlled substrate and we want to detect the film thickness. How do we do this? We control the film thickness of this layer in a very simple proof of principle demonstration by what is known as a layer by layer deposition. So we create a positive charge on our surface using for example a thiol molecule, you see this in a second, and then we add a negatively charged polymer, this adsorbs, then we add a positively charged polymer which will adsorb again, so we can layer by layer make this coating thicker and thicker and thicker. And it's very self-regulating because once all these, the first layer of polymer is adsorbed, then the charge of the complete structure is negative, so you will not absorb any more polymer layers. So it's very easy to control the film thickness at a very small length scale. So this is how it looks like. Here we have our nanostructures. Now we deposit our layers here. And then we can simply take UV vis spectra to see how this um, plasmon resonance shifts in the course of the experiment. And that's what we see here. So in the beginning, without any coatings, we have a resonance wavelength. That's right over here, and then the more layers we deposit, you see the more we shift our resonance wavelength to the red part of the spectrum, so to lower energies or higher wavelength. And then you can also see that if you plot this as a number of layers and you expect the peak position, then you see in the beginning you have a fairly linear increase, and as the layers become thicker and thicker and thicker, eventually they are so far away from the surface of the particles that you cannot detect any changes anymore. So you can probe how long or until which numbers of layers you can actually see or use the particles to see the change in dielectric environment. So from here on it's too far away and it's saturated. But very clearly now you can detect via the change of the plasma wavelengths how thick your layer has become. Okay, so this is more of a proof of principle uh, demonstration. Let's see what else we can do. The second is we can detect binding events directly occurring at the particle surface. And of course, the closer to the particle, the higher this near field enhancement and the higher all these interactions, so the more um, sensitive you will get to changes in the vicinity. So what we do here is, again, we make our nanostructures, and now we use thiol chemistry to bind molecules selectively onto the nanostructures. So it is known, let me just show this to you, that Molecules that have a thiol group can very strongly and very selectively bind to gold and silver. So if we simply incubate our nanostructures into a solution that contains a few of these thiol molecules, and they can have a very flexible chemistry, so you can attach a lot of different functionalities, which you, we will use in the next step, then they will simply assemble on the gold substrate without us needing to do anything. This is a concept known as self-assembled monolayers or SAMs and it's a very flexible, very simple and low-key technology to create very defined binding sites at gold surfaces. Okay, and now since as these molecules attach to our substrate we change the environment so we should see it from the resonance of the gold nanoparticles that, that is used as a substrate. And indeed, this is what people have done. So here you see the absorption of octane thiol, so a single molecule that has a chain length of, of eight CH2 groups, so it's much smaller than a nanometer. And you see, as you expose your gold nano triangles longer and longer with a solution containing this octane thiol, you see that the resonance wavelength shifts more and more. And eventually here, you don't see a shift anymore, and this indicates that now the entire gold nanostructure is full with these octane thiol molecules. So this is actually very astonishing. We can detect the binding event of single molecules or of a single molecule layer simply by an optical readout by measuring the resonance frequency. So it's really sensitive down to a molecular level. And not only can you extract it, you can even follow the kinetics of the absorption. So you see that more and more of these molecules attach. Okay, so now let's see if we can 
encode some functional properties and a very um, promising and uh, interesting concept is uh, the use in biosensing. So the question is whether we can now use this technology to detect the binding of some biologically relevant material. And ideally, of course, with a high sensitivity to distinguish it from other um, structures that could also bind. So how do we do this? The concept is again the same. So we, we make our nanostructures from a metal and now we can of course play around with the shape and so on to affect the sensitivity. And now we do two things. First, first we put antibodies onto the surface of the particles, either directly if they contain a thiol group or we use a thiol with let's say a certain um, end group that we can use to bind this antibody. And this antibody we simply um, indicate here by this, this kind of um, V-shaped structure. And then we exploit, and in, in biology, you very often have very defined binding events between an antibody and an antigene. So whenever we have an antigene now present in our solution, in our medium, maybe in our blood and so on, it will very selectively bind to the surface motif that we expose here, which is the antibody that's selective to the antigen. So we use, if you want, biological concepts, transfer them to our materials, and then are very selective in what we can sense. So these antibodies will only bind to a very defined antigene that is kind of selective to what we chose here. And if you can do this, then you should get an absorption or a change in resonance wavelength in two steps. So first we have our nanostructures that have a certain wavelength. Then we bind our antibodies, which are these ones here. Then we get a little bit of a shift. But this is still, if you want, the preparation of the sensor. And if we do this uh, properly, then we should be able to see the binding of a target molecule, which is this antigene, by a further shift in the resonance wavelength. And then we have a selective biosensor. So let's see how we can do this. First, I will show you an example of a very typical and standard um, kind of proof of principle. And this is the detection of biotin streptavitin binding. Biotin and streptavitin, I will show them to you in a second, are very good model systems and they constitute one of the strongest bonds that is found in biology that doesn't depend on covalent binding of two molecules. So it's a very good test system to see if this, this concept works. So how do we do this? First, we create a linker to our surface. Again, we use a thiol and in this case it has an amine function. And this amine function can now bind biotin, which is this molecule, vitamin B7, this is known as biotin, and this can be bound via an amide linkage so that we expose this structural motif. Now we have a surface that is coated with this specific molecule. And then streptavidine is a protein, it's much, much larger, and it's very complicated, so I just show you kind of the the generic representation, and this very selectively binds to biotin. So you see one biotin molecule that is kind of incorporated here. So if this biotin molecule is linked to a surface, in effect you bind the streptavitin molecule to the surface as well. And then you have your three steps of the sensor. And now let's see if we can detect, or if people manage to detect these binding events. And for this I'm showing you work of the Van Dyne group, and you see it's a bit of a busy slide, but you can distinguish different spectra. The first spectra, which is the black one here, is the pure, in this case, silver nanostructures. And then in the first step, they prepare the linker, which is this one here, and they get a little bit of a shift. This is now when you have the thyroids on the surface, similar to what, you, what I showed you before. Now in the next step, they add biotin. And then you create, let me just show this to you like this. This is the biotin molecule that now sits on top of these linkers. And again, you get a little bit of a shift more. And then they expose this whole now readily prepared sensor to solutions of streptavidine, which you can see here. And now you see that this larger streptavidine molecules can bind to your complex structure here. And you get as a readout an additional shift of this protein binding. And in summary, if you now expose this, you get an optical detection of this binding event of a protein to the surface. Okay, just to show you that there's a slightly different way of creating the sensor, we can also exploit what we talked about last week, this plasmon hybridization or this very strong shift in resonance if you bring two gold particles closer together. So in this case, we need to make our sensor a little bit more, um, 
or a little bit different, here we take one gold particle that is coated directly with stratdavidine molecules. Not what you see here. This is kind of the, the purple one. If you manage to do this, and if you manage to attach the biotin to a second population of particles, in this case they use this via a thiol terminated DNA, then you can get a binding of one particle to the second one. And this binding is mediated by the strong bond, bond of streptavitin to biotin. And that's what you see here. This is the pure gold particles. They look blue, as, as you would expect from gold nanoparticles. And if you bind a second particle, then you see suddenly the signal becomes completely different. And now it turns into, into red. And what you see here, now you have a dimer structure. And as we discussed last week, these dimer structures create a very strong shift in plasmon wavelength. And you can detect this from single molecule to like this dimer molecule. And also this can serve as a readout. The only thing that you need to really pay attention to is that you make your surface functionalization in a way that you can actually get this selective binding. OK, now let me just briefly show you an example on what people have used this concept for to detect something that is more relevant. And for this, let me just cite from a paper. This is this paper also from the Van Dyne group uh, um, that appeared in the Journal of the American Chemical Society already a few years ago. And what they argue is the following. There is a need for ultra-sensitive detection methods, especially for biological and chemical screening for important diseases. And this will help to, un to diagnose disease, but also to understand what is going on. And what they pick is an example of Alzheimer's disease, which we all know is a very brutal and um, complex a disease that um, uh, a lot of people suffer from and that slowly and steadily destroys your, let's say, um, capacities of your brain. And what is known about this Alzheimer's disease is that certain peptides or certain proteins seem to be going out of control and then deposit as plaques in your brain. And what they say here, the central role is these amyloid beta in the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease. And this amyloid beta is an amino acid peptide, so small protein that was discovered, discovered as the monomeric subunit of larger structures. And those are these amyloid fibrils of Alzheimer's disease plaques. So this is what you find in Alzheimer's patients, especially if they die and you do biopsies of, of their brains. You have a lot of these plaques, and they seem to be responsible for the degradation of the brain. And they consist of this amyloid beta. OK, and what is also known is that this amyloid beta will also save a sample into small, soluble oligomers that are known as ADDLs, emulite derived diffusible ligands. And those are, if you want, the precursors to form these blocks in the brain. So now their task was to set out to find and detect these structures here in samples, because if you can do this, then you can test for patients that are at risk of forming Alzheimer's, because they already have kind of the dangerous material in their blood, which will eventually form plaques in their brain and then decompose or cause neurological dysfunctions, especially relevant to memory, which is Alzheimer's disease. OK, very complicated task. We all know biology is tremendously complicated. And now their task was to really fish out a signal coming from these, if you want, Alzheimer precursor materials. And they used exactly the technique that I showed you before. So they found antibodies that are selective to the binding of these ADDLs, so these Alzheimer um, protein or Alzheimer plaques precursors. And then you could see that they bind selectively onto the surface of our gold, or well, in this case, silver nanostructure. And then they added a second antibody simply to enhance the amount of mass that is being adsorbed to the structure, because the more mass, the, more, the bigger the shift in um, the resonance wavelength because you deposit or you change the dielectric environment more. So this is the sensitivity step. And this is, if you want, a signal enhancement step. And here's what you see. Three curves. The black one is the original one. That's this one here. The second one is now when you actually bind these ADDLs, these um, amyloid, um, amyloid fibers. And the third one is now if you bind a second antibody to enhance the signal. And clearly, you see a shift between these three. And now you can do this with different concentrations of ADDL, so of the target molecule. This is what you see here, ADDL concentration in moles. 
And you see that at very high concentrations, of course, the signal saturates. And at extremely low concentrations, you cannot detect anything. And in between, you see that this shift in wavelength that you see at the top increases. And from this function, you now, you now can determine the limit of detection. And in this case, they determine it somewhere here. So you see the limit of detection is below 10 picomoles. So extremely, a picomole is approximately 10 to the power of minus 12 moles. So you can really detect these things in very low concentrations. And that's, of course, relevant for an early diagnostic to be able then eventually to know what's going on and to maybe treat these, uh, these patients. OK, so you see really that very fundamental concepts that we discuss here can be translated to very complex sensing problems. Good. OK, so now I want to move to a second application that's also related to sensing. And in this case, I want to talk about Raman spectroscopy and um, very precisely surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy. So the key concept here is that now we do not want to exploit the refractive index change of the material, but we want to exploit this focusing of electromagnetic energy. So there is much more electromagnetic energy if you want much more photons per time in the surrounding of the nanostructure compared to the outside. And now let's see how Raman relates to the numbers of photons. What is Raman spectroscopy? And of course, I do not want to go into detail here, just a very kind of simple and generic explanation, works via the following. It detects molecules via bond vibrations. So it's very simple, similar to IR spectroscopy, that you excite characteristic vibrations in a molecule. And these vibrations are uh, selective to a molecule. And if you now know the presence of these um, vibrations, you can infer what kind of a molecule you have in your analyte. And how does it work? So infrared absorption causes a change into different vibrational energy states. So kind of very small. This is the energy landscape, so it requires very little energy. And Raman detects the same thing, but works differently. You apply a lot of energy, so the electron is excited to an, a virtual excited state, and then it falls back from this excited state into a different vibrational energy state. There's two options. Typically, you excite it from the ground state, and it falls back to the first excited state. But because of thermal um, uh, movement, it can also be in the first excited state. You excite, and it falls back into the ground state. And then you have two things. This is Rayleigh scattering. So it's simply the same wavelength goes in and out. And then you have Stokes or anti stokes Raman scattering, where you lose parts of your intensity in the scattering event because of this IR absorption and the change of vibrational energy states. And again, this distance here is sensitive to certain vibrations in the molecule, and you can use this for detection. OK, so far so good. The only problem is that this Raman spectroscopy, or this process, is very inefficient. So you, you need a lot of um, excitations to observe these ones, because most of them will simply be ready scattering, where you don't lose energy and just goes up and down. So you need to get a lot of photons to get a, a, um, a high signal. So if you can increase the numbers of photons available, you get a higher sensitivity of the signal. So let's see how, this can, how our structure here can help. So the intensity of surface enhanced Raman scattering. Now what we're trying to do is exploit these near field enhancements here, that we have more photons available at our surface compared to a normal solution. So the intensity of the signal depends on the intensity of the incoming light wave, so this one here, and the intensity of the outgoing light wave, so this one here, or this one. Omega zero, this is the frequency of the incoming light wave. Omega zero minus, uh, minus omega resonance, this is what is missing here, and this is kind of the, um, the detection signal, right? This different difference caused by a different vibrational state. So if we now enhance our local field for the incoming beam and for the outgoing beam, we do the following. So first, the intensity always goes as the electric field squared. So we can square, we use the square of the local field here, both for incoming and for outgoing wave. And as we know that our field here is enhanced, we actually get a total signal enhancement if omega zero is larger than omega, which it always is, just compare the, si the length of these arrows, this one against this one. So this is easily fulfilled. 
we get a total enhancement that goes with the fourth um, uh, uh, potence of the electric field. So E local to the power of 4 gives you the enhancement. And now if we compare, this is a single particle here that already has an enhancement of 5. You've seen last week that a dimer easily has an enhancement of 10. And then you already get 10 to the power of 4 is a 10,000 fold increase in signal intensity. And if you optimize your structures more, you've seen that a crescent shaped particle, for example, has a near field enhancement of approximately 30 or so. You can make more sophisticated structures that maybe approach a near field enhancement of a, a thousand, uh, of a hundred. And then you get a very, very strong enhancement of the SIR signal in the orders of millions and uh, tens of millions. So really orders of magnitudes higher compared to a normal Raman scattering event. So this is the whole key concept of surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy that ex exploits that you have more photons available in close vicinity to a surface. Now let's, let me briefly discuss with you one possible design of such a Raman substrate, which I found kind of neat. So what these people did here in this group is they make nano pillars and these pillars are coated by gold, what you see here. And then they have an analyte which is in the gas phase, so this kind of flows around here and they want to de detect this analyte. So then they use a solvent and as the solvent evaporates you create fairly strong capillary forces and these capillary forces make these nanopillars bend and then cluster together. Okay, so this is what you also can see in the SEM images here. This is one of these clusters where the gold structures are now sitting very close together. We already know that structures close together cause high near field enhancements. And you see here, outside of the drop you don't have clustering, inside the drop you have very clear clustering. And now the idea is that as we cluster, you see the analytes bind to the gold surface and if we cluster we bring them into this region between the two nanostructures which is the hotspot and this should then provide a much higher local near field and this higher local near field should translate into a higher intensity of the detected Raman signal. Therefore, surface enhanced, enhanced by this part, Raman spectroscopy. So let's see if this works. Here we get different SIRS signals for different substrates. First, they compare a commercial substrate in red, you see here. And indeed, you can get characteristic signals like here, 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 here of your analyte, but this is already magnified by a factor of 100 in that intensity scale. So it's not a very efficient way. Yes, you can use it as a detection, but you need a lot of analyte. Now they make the non-leaning nanopillars. So those are the nanopillars before they actually aggregate and then form these very defined hotspots. And here you see the signal becomes better, much clearer peaks, but also this one is magnified by a factor of 10. So still not a very efficient process. Now they do what they call pre-lean nanopillars. So that means they bring the nanopillars together using water and the capillary forces that form these, these dimers or clusters with a very defined hotspot and then they absorb the analyte. Now the analyte cannot completely go into the hotspot but very close to it. And again you see the signal becomes much higher, the peaks are even more defined and it's also not magnified anymore. So the difference between this and this is actually fairly dramatic. And then they do the final experiment where they first expose the substrate to the analyte and then they cluster them together. So now the analyte really sits right in the hotspot. And now you see that the peaks are much, much bigger again and you get the highest possible signal. And if you now compare commercial substrate to this one, it's a huge orders of magnitude difference in the detected signal. And that means, of course, you can detect much lower signals and modern substrates and modern technologies can go down to really detect individual molecules at the surface of very defined nanostructures. So it's an extremely sensitive process that can be used to detect molecules. Okay, maybe one other application of this SIRS um, system, and this is an application that goes into biological systems. In this case, this is from the group of Louis Dies Massam in San Sebastian. They used um, plasmonic nanostructures to sense or to do bacteria quorum sensing. 
So we know, maybe as a bit of a background, bacteria colonize substrates and they typically do this in the form of a biofilm. And that is a really big problem because this biofilm protects all these bacteria from the environment. So it forms, if you want, a shielding. They build a house around themselves or kind of a, a protective layer. And if they have a protective layer, then it means that they increase their resistance, for example, to antibiotics, because the antibiotic cannot really reach the bacteria anymore. And this can then really cause big problems because you cannot treat them efficiently anymore. And if you cannot treat them, then you have a much increased environment. So the bacteria becomes more dangerous. And that's a huge problem, especially in hospitals. And the bacteria can only form a biofilm if there's a lot of them. And there is a mechanism that the bacteria use to actually detect or sense whether they are strong enough to form a biofilm. And this is known as quorum sensing. So quorum means if there's enough particles or enough bacteria, similar to a quorum if you have a vote. So if you have enough uh, people that can vote and you, you establish a quorum. And the bacteria um, do this by secreting a molecule. The other bacteria can sense this, and, uh, sense this molecule. And if the concentration of these molecules is high enough, then it tells them, yes, we are enough. We can build a biofilm and protect ourselves. So this is kind of, in a nutshell, the biological process that leads to the formation of a biofilm. And of course, now it would be interesting and important to understand how much of these molecules do you need, how far these molecules diffuse, and how these bacteria kind of interact and, and, um, and, and sense via these molecules. Now, the question was, can, can these molecules that bacteria use to establish a quorum be detected in extremely low qu uh, concentrations? And the idea was to use SIRS, because I've already showed you that it's a very sensitive technique that is theoretically able to capture these molecules. This is what the group set out to. And in order to do this, you need to think a little bit about the design of substrates. And the requirement really is that the bacteria needs to be separated from the molecules they secrete for the chrome sensing. Otherwise, you only detect all the molecules of the membranes of the bacteria. So you really need to, if you want, establish a filter that only small molecules can pass, but that keeps the bacteria away from the sensing platform of gold nanostructures. And the idea that these people came up with is to use mesoporosilica, so a buffer layer, if you want, or um, a separation layer that has very small pores so that only small molecules can diffuse through. And if they can diffuse through, they reach the plasmonic nanoparticles that act as the sensor. So you see, this is how it looks like. You have inside you these gold nanoparticles in close vicinity, so they create hotspots that can be used for the SIRS sensing, and this is covered by this layer of small pores of mesoporous silica that is used to separate the bacteria and large molecules, proteins, and so on from reaching these plasmonic nanostructures. And now they use these substrates, they, they culture bacteria, and they measure the evolution of a certain molecule, pyrocyanin, which is known to, um, to uh, induce biofilm formation, and they can characterize how the whole process works. And indeed, here you see that indeed it works. So here are the different Raman signals over time. And you see that as these bacteria start to colonize the surface, they secrete more and more of this pyrocyanin. And you can also then see where on the substrate you have the highest concentration. So here, this is where the biofilm has been formed. And you see that this molecule actually extends quite far outside. So bacteria here are attracted to the biofilm and can then uh, if you want to move in the direction of this gradient to join the colony and form biofilms. And here you see the Raman profile as a function of distance. So you see the signal degrades, but over a really long distance, no? from the center to a few millimeters. Now this can be used to really uh, investigate and understand how bacteria sense each other and then establish biofilms. So you see that the sensing approach is not something that theoretically pops out of equations, but really finds applications in uh, modern research and, in, if you want, in the medical sector especially. Okay, there's one more concept I want to discuss with you, and this is, if you want, a side product. So we discussed that light absorption by particles leads to these hot spots. And we also discussed that these, the whole absorption process comes from electrons being accelerated up and down all the time. And very clearly, this causes friction, 
And these localized hotspots also focus a lot of energy into a small spot, which is what a magnifying glass does as well. And I think we all know that a magnifying glass right into sunlight can be used to burn a hole into paper. And somewhat this effect is very similar, that you get a very localized increase in heat. And this aspect is known as thermoplasmonics. So if you have an array of particles on a surface, and if you now very carefully measure the heat emitted of these particles when you shine light onto them, then you see here is a temperature landscape, delta T from 0 to 50 degrees or so. You see that indeed the particles heat up. Now we see this here, and you can also simulate this, and you also see the heat evolution from these structures. So let's see how efficient this heat evolution can be. So here again, what I'm going to show you, it's sufficiently high to make water boil. So here you see again the setup. Here are gold nanoparticles. Now they are coated by water, sitting on a glass substrate, so you can shine a laser from the bottom to really get a lot of um, photons or a lot of electromagnetic energy into these particles. And then what these researchers here did is they looked at the temperature increase as a function of the laser power. And you see, for a lot of different laser powers, you get, and a lot of different diameters here of the spot, you get a rapid increase in the temperature. You now sometimes for, it depends a bit, uh, uh, it takes a little bit longer. If you have a larger spot, if you focus more, then you get a higher um, coupling of the heat, and it always reaches above 200 degrees. And it always stops somewhat between 220 and 240 degrees. So it becomes super hot. It's hot like a, um, like an oven that runs at pretty much full capacity. And why does it not increase higher? Because eventually you start to nucleate a vapor bubble. And that's what you see here in this high-speed video camera image. So you shine the laser from here and suddenly a bubble emerges and this bubble then very quickly grows in size. And the reason why the water is not boiling at 100 degrees but only at 200 degrees is that you actually have an overheating because you don't have a, it's not so easy to nucleate this bubble. That's also not something that's related to this lecture here, but you need to provide more energy to, um, to overcome an energy barrier associated with the formation of a new interface. And this is approximately at 200 degrees. But the bottom line is, very efficiently and very locally, you heat up tremendously. Okay? So much that you can make water boil. And now people have exploited this in different applications. The first one is maybe more straightforward. You can actually boil water. And in this case, these particles, the gold particles, are in solution. And now when you irradiate them with light, then you start to form this vapor bubble. This vapor bubble goes to the interface, releases the hot vapor, and then sinks down again. In this way, you can really cook water or boil water without having to heat the entire subface. Because only locally, you create small vapor bubbles, they become positively buoyant, go to the interface, release the vapor, then the, water, then the molecule, sorry, the particle becomes heavier again, sinks down again, and this goes on and on to evaporate water. And here's the experiment to this. So what they do is they focus sunlight very strongly into their solution here. They put an ice bath around it to cool it. And then they have a temperature sensor here in the gas stream and the pressure sensor to see how much vapor is being produced. And they compare gold nanoparticles, or actually gold nanoshells, doesn't really matter, with carbon black particles. And what they see is that both carbon black, of course, also absorbs radiation fairly well. So you see an increase in pressure which means that water is actually starting to boil, but this is more efficient for the gold nano shells. And then if you look at the temperature that you detect here, you see that you actually have a fairly high temperature arising from these gold nano shells because of this localized evaporation of water. So really this can be a way to use sunlight or laser light or whatever light to actually purify water, boil water, make disinfections and so on. Okay, another possibility, speaking about disinfections, you can also directly use this thermoplasmonic effect to kill bacteria, so to make antibacterial materials. How do you do this? Well, you use gold nanowatts. You see they have an absorption in the IR range. That's something we discussed in the last, uh, last week, in the last chapter. And now these people did a surface modification to make these gold nanowatts stick well to bacteria. So this is, again goes into this antibody antigene uh, binding that you need to find some structural motifs on the bacteria surface that allows binding of these nanowatts. 
And now you can shine light, heat up the nanowatts, and then burn holes into the bacteria. And when you do this, you see the following. So here is percentage of life, which is the black ones, or dead, which is the, the gray cells, and they compare the pure cells. Most of them are alive, meaning that the gold nanowatts, so if you change this, this is cells plus watts, they are not toxic, no, it's comparable. If you shine IR light onto the cells, it also is not toxic to the cells. But now, if you add gold nanowatts to the cells and shine IR light, then you see, this is this scenario here, you see that pretty much all of the bacteria cells die because the heating of the gold nanowatts burns holes into their membrane and then they explode. Okay, and the last application I want to discuss is to actually use this local burning of holes as a means to deliver drugs or maybe genes into different cells. So clearly if you have a gene defect or if you need to treat somebody or also if you want to see if certain um, methods of treatment are efficient, you want to be able to get materials into a cell in a very efficient way. And here the idea is to use this localized burning of holes, which is known as optoporation, to actually get access and bring materials into the cell. So the idea is the following. You have a cell on a thermoplasmonic substrate. Now you surround it with molecules that you want to bring onto the cell. You heat up by using this thermoplasmonic effect. By heating up, you poke a little hole into the cell membrane. And now the molecules can diffuse into the cell. And if you do this short enough, then the membrane doesn't completely disintegrate, but you only temporarily poke a small hole. Then you switch off the laser again. So the membrane recovers, and now we have something delivered into the cell. And this is how people did this. So again, you need to think about how to tailor your substrate, because first, you need to have a very efficient and very local heat evolution. And secondly, you need to make sure that there's a reservoir to get diffusion into the cells. And an example of this are these nano pyramids that are gold coated. And if you look at the temperature profile, you get a very high temperature at the tips of these nano pyramids. And then you can culture cells, and you see these cells will sit on these substrates, and the tips of the pyramids are in contact with the backside of the cells, so you actually have contact to the cell membrane, and you can poke holes in it. And now let's see it at the results. If you shine laser, then you can deliver a dye into the cells. And the dye is just uh, as a means, as a proof of principle, that actually something goes in. So if the dye is in the cells, you see that the cells become green, so this tells you indeed the delivery process was um, successful. And then you also need to test whether the cells actually survive the delivery process. And for this, you use a different type of staining where you can look for metabolism in the cell. And only if the cells are alive, they can undergo uh, metabolism. And this then changes a, a different dye into a color. And then you see that if you see a color, then the cells are alive and well and working. And this is what you see in the lower picture. And then you can superimpose these two effects. So you see, here's the percentage of um, either cells that are alive or cells that have dye incorporated. And you see, at low laser fluences, of course, all the cells are alive. And if you increase the laser energy more and more, this drops because eventually you damage the cells too much. But before you do this, you see that the efficiency of delivery gets higher and higher, and then also decreases as the holes become too big. And then you find an optimum spot where all the cells survive and most of the cells have um, an effective delivery of the material. And by this, you can now really play around with engineering cells, testing drugs, testing gene therapies, and so on and so forth. Okay, as the very last example of today, let me discuss one commercial example, and that is a pregnancy test. And the pregnancy test works in the following way. You have an analyte that you want to detect. This is a hormone that only appears in pregnant women. So this is kind of the telltale trace of pregnancy. And now in this test body, so this, this analyte liquid, typically urine, will flow in this direction over the sensor. And while it does so, it will first come to a layer of gold nanoparticles that is coated with an antibody that's selective to this hormone that is in the urine. So then it will fly over and come to a test line that is now coated with an anti-analyte antibody. So only if you have these red hormones in your solution will the gold nanoparticles be able to bind here. 
If you don't have the red one, they cannot bind here. You see this very clearly here. No, only the red one is now, this, this hormone is now sandwiched between these two antibodies and effectively fixes the gold nanoparticle to this test line. And then you have a second line, this is a control line that is not selective and that will bind to these gold particles directly via this antibody that's on the gold particles. And this is just kind of as a control line to see that the test itself has been successful. And now this, if you now apply this as a pregnancy test, a test, there is two possible outcomes. First is it can be positive, then you're pregnant, and this is when both the test line and the control line becomes red. And secondly, it can also be negative. That means you're not pregnant, and this is when only the second line is positive. So this tells you, yes, the test was successful, but you didn't detect any analyte, any hormone, pregnancy-related hormone. And you can also, well, if you have something that is somewhat ambiguous, then you repeat the test to, to check more carefully. Okay, this is the typical classical pregnancy test. Nowadays, there's a lot of digital versions on that that work differently. But traditionally, this is the typical test that has been used to indicate a pregnancy. And this really um, encompasses a lot of these aspects that, that we talked about. First, you need to exploit the color of gold nanoparticles. This is the red line that you see. If the gold particles are not colored, you cannot use it, obviously. Secondly, you need to be able to very selectively functionalize gold nanoparticles, which you can do via this diol chemistry and then binding of uh, chemical or biochemical antibodies, antigenes, and so on. And then you need to exploit this biochemistry, so which is known as bioconjugate chemistry, that you really find pairs that are very selective to bind to an analyte model and then use this to again bind to the test line, so to achieve this sandwich structure here. And in this case, the pregnancy hormone, so this is human chorionic uh, gonatropine, which is the hormone that can be used to detect a pregnancy, needs to be immobilized at this test line using this bioconjugate chemistry. So all in all, this is really an example on uh, a commercial exploitation of all these fancy properties of gold nanoparticles. And with this, I'm at the end of today's lecture. So in summaries, we have seen that there's a lot of different special properties of gold nanoparticles or noble metal nanoparticles, and this allows them to be exploited in different applications. So first of all, we have a localized surface plasma resonance, which can be used as a coloration. Think about the leucogus cup, think about the church, or think about the pregnancy test. Then we have seen that this resonance is sensitive to the, the, uh, to the dielectric environment of the particles. This can then be used for sensing. We also have a high near-field enhancement, and this allows molecular detection via the surface-enhanced Raman spectroscopy. And also, it allows localized heating. So if you shine light, you also heat up the surrounding of the gold nanoparticle, and this can be used, for example, to purify water, to kill bacteria, or to really deliver active biological material into the cell. There's much more complicated optical or optical and photonic applications as well, especially in the terms of metamaterials. And in this case, you really exploit the scattering and um, absorption of light from metal nanostructures to shape light waves in space. So you array different metal nanostructures in a way that the complete uh, light field is controlled as it goes through the structures and come out. And if you do this correctly, you get very fascinating and if you want weird optical effects, such as a negative index of refraction, perfect lenses, so very flat lenses, only working by focusing light beams from the interaction of light with the nanostructures, or even optical cloaking, so that you can, if you want, hide an object in space simply by tailoring how the light wave comes out of these metal or also dielectric nanostructures. This is not something I want to cover in this lecture here, but if you're interested in this, Google around and you see very interesting applications. Thank you very much for um, listening, and with this I will leave you until next week. Thank you.